Do you have any questions? Yeah. What happened with mine? Over a period of time, things kept changing, and then they took up a bodhisattva vow because nobody was becoming arahats. So they tried to make the bodhisattva vow the main thing and put down any other teaching that said, no, let's get off the wheel now. Oh, but you're selfish if you don't take the bodhisattva vow. And that's what they're really teaching. There's a lot of books on, on the bodhisattva vow, how important it is. And the Tibetans have gone a step further and they say, well, the bodhisattva vow means that I am not going to attain Nibbana until all beings can attain Nibbana. Well, the Buddha couldn't do it. If he could, we wouldn't be here. So that's not a realistic vow, but it does stop people from attaining Nibbana. A bodhisattva vow is a vow to become a future Buddha. And <clears throat> when you start seeing how really difficult it is, after 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 lifetimes, and you start <coughs> going, and I have to do <coughs> do this for four Mahakapas? No, I don't want to do that anymore. Now, they can be re reborn when there is no Buddha era. And they're lost. That means they just keep going round and round on the wheel of sansara. Birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. And immeasurable amounts of suffering and pain. You know, I, I really do believe the statement that the Buddha made. If, if you put all of the tears from all of your lifetimes together, they would be bigger than the oceans. Because we've all suffered in so many lifetimes. <coughs> <coughs> Let's get off the wheel now and help other people get off the wheel. That's the one. But I tell people that if they've taken a bodhisattva vow, I'm not going to judge them whether they want to keep it or not. But if they want to let go of the bodhisattva vow, I tell them how they can do that. Then. It's their choice. I don't care anymore. So in, in a nutshell, what is the, the vow? What is the practice of it? What, what, how does it change how they live and how they practice? It doesn't, basically. It doesn't. They, they take a vow that they're going to become a future Buddha and they try to act compassionately. Some lifetimes they're good at it, some lifetimes they're bad at it. See, there's these ten things, they're called perfections, that the Buddha developed. And there's, there's three levels of development. And to be a future Buddha, you have to go through to the end of the development of each one of those good qualities. And it takes a long time to perfect it. I mean, Gotama Buddha was called an intelligent Buddha. It took him four Mahakapas and a hundred thousand lifetimes to become a Buddha. I think that's four expansions of the universe and contractions of the universe. Four of those. That's a huge, long period of time. 
There are some bodhisattvas that are called energetic bodhisattvas. And it takes them eight mahakapas in a hundred thousand lifetimes. And then there is a moral Buddha. And a moral Buddha, it takes 16 mahakapas in a hundred thousand lifetimes. So you're talking about huge expanses of time where there is big amounts of suffering that's happening. Some lifetimes you learn from, some you don't. It's not always perfecting one of these highly good qualities. And in some of the earlier texts, this, there's 32 qualities or 32 things that have to happen in order to become a real bodhisattva. And one of those things is making the vow in front of a Buddha. And he looks into the future and sees that you have the determination to do it. And he'll say yes. But a lot of people that take that vow now, it stops them from going deeper into meditation and experiencing Nibbana. That's the nature of the vow. And they will renounce that vow at some point because they haven't got the assurance that the Buddha said, or a Buddha said, yes, you will become a future Buddha. They don't happen all that often. In, in this Buddha era, we have six Buddhas that appear. Is the Buddha era the 25,000? No, no, we're talking long periods of time. And there are some Buddha eras that there's none. There's some Buddha eras that there's only one. So we're very, very lucky to be born in a time when there are, have been a lot of Buddhas and we're in the, the dispensation of the Buddha right now. I mean, the merit that we have to make to be that close to a Buddha is stunning. It's really remarkable. So take advantage of it. Your choice. There's nothing that can be more precious than being around when we still have the suttas in reasonably good shape. And we can still decipher what the Buddha is talking about. Probably in another those 700 to 1,000 years, all of these books will be lost. And then there's just some small suttas that people will use. And the understanding of Vinaya for monks, the rules of the monks, they won't even be able to recite one rule of being a monk. And that's at the end of the, this Buddha era. Lady Sayadaw used to call this, this time being so close to the time of the Buddha, he said, this is the age of saints. And we're in the age of saints. Every time somebody experiences Nibbana, they become a saint which is a whole lot different than a lot of other traditions hold. <laughs>